when I sat down to write a book, the good thing about the trade I'm in is it's a pretty simple format. You can find it in the Bible, which has the best opening sentence ever. In the beginning, comma. You make it a narrative. You make it chronological. You tell a story. Trying to get out of the way, because it's not about you, it's about the subject. I try to mix up the topics, but all of them have the theme we talk about, which is creativity. What causes it? How does it happen? How does creativity come from the intersection of the arts and the sciences? Welcome to Straight Talk, a podcast about big ideas featuring candid discussions with some of the world's foremost thinkers and doers. I'm Hank Paulson, chairman of the Paulson Institute, and today I'm speaking with Walter Isaacson. Walter Isaacson is a Leonard Lauder Professor of American History and Values at Tulane. He is the past CEO of the Aspen Institute, where he is now a distinguished fellow and has been the chairman of CNN and the editor of Time Magazine. Walter is a prolific author and has written biographies of Jennifer Doudna, Leonardo da Vinci, Steve Jobs, Albert Einstein, Benjamin Franklin, and Henry Kissinger. He is also the author of The Innovators, how a group of hackers, geniuses, and geeks created the digital revolution and co-author of The Wise Men, Six Friends and the World They Made. He is currently writing a biography of Elon Musk. Walter, welcome to the podcast. It's great to be with you. Walter, I've been a big admirer You've been a real thought leader and a difference maker in a number of important areas. And I really appreciated the opportunity to work closely with you when we set up the Aspen Economic Strategy Group. So I'm looking forward to today's discussion. Now, let's start in New Orleans, Louisiana, where you were born and raised. What was it like growing up in New Orleans? Talk about your upbringing and how it shaped your early interests. Well, here I am sitting here in New Orleans, right on St. Charles Avenue, about four blocks from where I was born, about eight blocks from where I grew up, and about six blocks from where I went to nursery school and then high school. So uh, it's good to be home. I have deep roots here. And one of the things about New Orleans uh, that you'd appreciate, Hank, is that it's a port city of a variety of peoples who have come over the past three centuries to New Orleans starting with the Chickamauga indigenous people, then the French and the Spanish and the Germans and the Italians and the Jews and slaves and freed slaves and gentlemen of color and the high Creole aristocracy, as well as the Cajuns. When they come together in a place like this, that type of diverse backgrounds, I think, helps create a a spark, which adds to innovation, creativity, and for that matter, art. I mean, you can just take jazz, which I was very involved with growing up right around the corner here. You know, I used to play clarinet and I studied people like Louis Armstrong, whose parents had come down from the plantation, members of the Sanctified Church, but he listened to and sometimes played the French Opera House, was in part of the Creole Foxtrot orchestras. And then the Spanish American, the Americans coming back from the Spanish American Wars, hawking their horns, and a nice Jewish peddler named Karnofsky, bought him a horn and told him to play the horn on the back of the peddler's cart to attract customers. All of that comes together to create great art. And I feel very privileged I lived in such a diverse uh, environment. Well, Walter, as that answer to that first question shows, you have a gift for storytelling. And of course, anyone familiar with your writing knows that's the case. So where did this come from? I had a mentor. I used to call him Uncle Walker, didn't quite know what he did for a living. Uh, We'd go water skiing with his daughter. Uh, He was sort of a cousin, friend, that sort of thing. And um, we always say, Ann, what's your dad do? He's always sitting on the dock eating hogshead cheese and drinking bourbon. And Percy said, well, my dad's a writer. His name was Walker Percy. And of course, you've heard of him. He's a famous writer was a famous writer, wrote the movie Goer and many other great books. But back then he hadn't even published a novel and I did not know you could be a 
writer. I knew you could be an engineer like my father and grandfather, or a doctor like my uncles, or a lawyer perhaps, or a fisherman. But I thought, okay, you could actually just sit around and write all day. And eventually the moviegoer came out. I was about 10, 12 years old, and I read it. And it was a beautiful tale, but it kind of was above my head because it had lots of philosophical lessons. So I asked Uncle Walker, what are you trying to teach in here? What are those lessons? And he said to me, there are two types of people who come out of Louisiana, preachers and storytellers. He said, for heaven's sake, be a storyteller. The world's got far too many preachers. A great story. Now, Walter, I'm going to switch gears a bit. You've had a multifaceted career as a media executive, journalist, the impactful builder and leader of the Aspen Institute for 15 years, and now as a university professor. Of course, throughout this time, you were the author of many books. So Walter Isaacson, the author, is the constant. But is there another common thread between all of these jobs? What role have you enjoyed the most? Well, there are a couple of things. One of them is that I'm sometimes a generalist. Maybe you could disparage it as a dilettante. When I first went to Time Magazine, there was a position called floater. It's almost like maybe utility infielder, you'd call it in Chicago. But a floater would get up every week and on Monday look at the staff list. And one week you'd be writing medicine. The next week you'd be writing in the music section. The next week you'd be doing foreign policy or maybe the business section or maybe the science section. And so you learned a lot about different fields. So I always define myself as somebody who loved to know all I could possibly know about every different field. The people I write about, partly because I consciously chose them for this purpose, are that way. Leonardo da Vinci is a person in history who most knew everything you could know about every field that was knowable. Likewise, Ben Franklin. You know, we think of him as a doddering dude flying a kite in the rain, but those electricity experiments most important science experiments of the time. So Franklin understands how to connect science to governance, to checks, to balances, to Newtonian mechanics, to music, to art. So does Leonardo, so does Steve Jobs. They connect the arts and the sciences. So the theme of what I hope my life has been and the theme of my books is that creativity comes from those who can connect the arts and the sciences, who can connect engineering, to poetry and liberal arts and the humanity. Yes, Walter, an intellectual curiosity is a key part of that. That's an interesting thing. I've said to people all along, you know, there's a push towards specialization. And, you know, specialization will make a average performer better than average. It'll make a good performer better than good. But what you really want, if you really want to excel, you're going to be a generalist. You're not going to get pushed to be a specialist unless you need to be. So again, I totally ascribe to what you've just said. Now, in your books, you gravitate toward innovation and genius. Writing about some of the world's foremost innovators, creative figures, and geniuses. Leonardo da Vinci, as you've mentioned, Albert Einstein, Steve Jobs, Jennifer Doudna. And I know of no one better to place the current frontiers of today's technology in a historical context. But I want to start with some of the lessons from your books. Let's begin with genius. What makes a genius? What do some of the history's greatest minds have in common? And then we'll go next to, to innovation. But start with genius. You know, Hank, throughout your career, you've known a whole lot of smart people. Goldman Sachs, to government, to every think tank you've been at. And at a certain point, you realize, as I did, that smart people are a dime a dozen. They don't always amount to much. Now, some of them, like your friend Larry Summers, are so wickedly, awesomely smart, they amount to something. But usually, it's the people who can think creative, think out of the box. So my view is that being innovative, being creative, being able to think out of the box is more important than the mental processing power that makes somebody smart. I think that comes from curiosity. It comes from being interested, as we said, in a wide variety of fields. So you can see the ripples of different patterns across fields, across nature. And that ability to think different, to use Steve Jobs' term. If you look at Albert Einstein, he was the 
fifth smartest person in his class at the Zurich Polytech. And I think there are only eight people in the class. He wasn't even as smart as his girlfriend, Maleva Marich, in terms of traditional grades and smartness. But when they're trying to figure out why the speed of light always seems constant and why Maxwell's equations even if you try to catch up with a light wave that follows Maxwell's equations, the light wave will always travel at the same speed. Einstein thinks out of the box and says, I get it. Time is relative. Speed of light's always constant, but time is relative. It takes them a while to figure out, what are you talking about? Time is relevant. But that's the type of out-of-box thinking that made him a genius and people like Poincaré merely smart. You know, Walter, it's interesting because at a much different level, I've always made the point that I can look at someone very early on and make a pretty good assessment by asking myself, are they defining their job expansively? You can have a very bright young associate at Goldman Sachs or a treasury that when you ask a question, does all the work, very smart, answers the questions right. But the best ones say, how does this fit into the biggest picture? You know, how do I think out of the box? How do I do that? Now, you gave a very good explanation of an innovator. Can you give us or give me an example of an innovator who may not be a household name like Steve Jobs? Well, as you know, I wrote a book recently about gene editing, about the ability to use something called CRISPR, which is not all that complicated because bacteria have been using it for a billion years and they're not much smarter than we are. And then with a CRISPR molecule, you can edit human DNA. You can make yourself taller or make your eyes blue or whatever you want in the future. It's not quite safe yet. And the person who thought of that was Jennifer Doudna and her partner in uh, research, Emmanuel Charpentier, a European. They won the Nobel Prize a couple of years ago. And they're not household names, but I do think that the innovation of being able to edit the human genome and by the way, it uses a messenger and single guide RNA technologies that we're using for our COVID vaccines now. But the ability to treat molecules the way we treat microchips, in other words, to take molecules and reprogram them the way we reprogram microchips, that will be the advance in our day and generation that's as important as the one 50 years ago when Bill Gates and Steve Jobs with the Homebrew Computer Club, and they realized that the microchip had just been invented. So Walter, I wanna now switch to policy. So in today's world, how does a US stack up in terms of leadership and innovation? And do we have the right policies, programs, and institutions to continue to foster innovation? Yes, and let's start with the good news. We have a set of policies that were instituted after World War II that has created the greatest research and innovation engine in the world. And it's a policy framework. It's not, you know, so it's exactly up your line. It was done by probably the most important, least known policy person of that period, Vannevar Bush who was in charge of scientific policy for well, Roosevelt, then Truman, and then to some extent, Eisenhower. He had been a provost at MIT. He was a founder of Raytheon, and he was in government, and he oversees the atomic bomb project and the laser project and all scientific research during the war. His foot was in all three camps, academia, private industry, government. And so what he did after uh, 1946, in a paper called Science, the Next Fr the Endless Frontier, is say that our research in our country should be based on a collaboration between government funding, academic research centers, like, uh, you know, in your place, University of Chicago was one of the biggest and still is, and private industry. And you had to have a whole lot of complicated laws and regulations to figure out how to do it. Like Birch Bay and Bob Dole, your friends created the Dole Bay Act to say if government research funding is used at a university to create something of value that's patented, here's how we're going to divvy up the proceeds. And so things like the transistor, which happens at Bell Labs, or the microchip, or for that matter, messenger RNA at the University of Pennsylvania, these things all get translated 
from being an academic idea and then being government funded research and then being a commercial product. That's how we beat every country so far. However, we can look at some downsides. I've been traveling with Elon Musk, just got back. He's my next topic. And he was introducing his Optimus robot. Now, if you want to go online and see this introduction of a new robot, there's 17 people on stage. Out of the 17 people on stage, including Elon Musk, one, one out of 17, was born in the United States. The rest had come to MIT and Carnegie Mellon and Caltech and Stanford and gotten green cards after they got their PhDs. And they're part of this renewal of America's innovative uh, things. So immigration has been an engine of innovation and research and development. And I'm afraid that we're messing that part up. I think you could be even more definitive. We are messing that part up. We need to be either optimistic or pessimistic about our ability to correct it, right? Because right now it's a major problem. Now, Walter, just push a little bit farther. And I think you've largely answered this, but technology obviously poses huge challenges and opportunities for society, right? So what are the risks and the opportunities? Do we have in the U.S. the ability to keep up with the rapid advances in technology and innovation in order to manage the risks and capture the opportunities? Or do the risks outweigh the benefits? What do we need to do differently in the U.S. to help policymakers understand technology and put the right policies in place? I think step one would be to end some of the knee-jerk polarization between the parties and the ideological poles and the populist versus, you know, the establishment and the left versus the right. Because most of these issues, whether it's regulating internet speech or regulating how we're going to edit the genes of our children, are things that really uh, are not ideological or shouldn't be. And uh, we should try to form consensus on what to do. We used to do that all the time. As I mentioned, Birch Bayh and Robert Dole did it it's so importantly, when it came to research 40, 50 years ago, that was a Republican leader and a Democratic leader, and they were able to do it. At the moment, for example, gene editing is not something that's been politicized. You have really good senators that are Democratic and Republican who care about what are the rules of the road going to be when we edit in a hereditary way uh, the genes of humans. But you go to another topic similar, which is the internet and the regulation of Twitter and Facebook and whether Section 230 should allow companies such as Facebook and Twitter not to be responsible for things people post on it. That used to be something that also was a bipartisan concern. You had people really smart like Rob Portman working with people really smart like Ron Wyden, Democrat and Republican. But now you're starting to see the ideological polarization around these issues, which means it's going to be harder for us to come to a consensus that most people will accept is a good compromise. So much of the challenge we have today is really the polarization of our society and of our political institutions and particularly members of Congress. You know, that's what we were trying to do at the Aspen Institute, especially when you walked in the door and said, let's do an economic strategy group. As you know, we already had a national security strategy group, which had been run by Brent Scowcroft and Joe Nye, and then Condi Rice took over from Brent. But it was Democrats and Republicans saying, what do we do about, you know, help create the Sam Nunn, uh, Richard Luger, Nunn Luger Act on nuclear weapons. What are we going to do about Ukraine? What are we going to do about Russia? And trying to say, all right, where can we agree so that this doesn't become a partisan issue? You did the same thing when you created an economic strategy group. And as you know, we have a health strategy group and others. It's those type of things when you put together the people you do at your economic strategy group, that's sort of us clinging, us meaning Americans, clinging to that notion that we're good people and we can walk across the aisle. And, you know, the American people, I'm convinced, are good people. And I'm convinced that the American people are at the center. But our political system forces them to the extremes. 
Correct. And that's what's got to be fixed most importantly, is the dozens of things, at least a dozen that are stand right out, that push us to the extremes, as opposed to doing what the Aspen Economic Strategy Group, which is let's unify and unite. Absolutely. Now let's talk about Walter Isaacson, the author. You've written a number of definitive biographies which break new ground even on the most well-known figures. That takes a serious commitment of time. And given that level of care, research, and thoughtfulness that you bring to each of your books, each biography is a multi-years long commitment. How do you decide, Walter, what to write about? And what is your process for writing a biography? I have you know, just marveled at how you are able to do that while maintaining the rest of your workload. You know, sometimes journalists that work for one publication or another will take a leave of absence and write a book. I've never known you to take a leave of absence. So I don't know how many hours you need to sleep a night, but talk a little bit about how you decide what to write about and how you go about it and how you manage everything else. You know, I'm somebody who loves to be a storyteller, as we said at the beginning of this podcast. And if you love doing something, it's not hard to find time to do it. For me, you don't know, have to say, how do you find so much time to write books? It's a mind expanding, but relaxing thing for me. I try to mix up the topics, but all of them have the theme we talk about, which is creativity. What causes it? How does it happen? How does creativity come from the intersection of the arts and the sciences? And then when I sat down to write a book. The good thing about the trade I'm in is it's a pretty simple format. You can find it in the Bible, which has the best opening sentence ever. In the beginning, comma. You make it a narrative. You make it chronological. You tell a story. And so whether it's, you know, Einstein or or Steve Jobs, you're just telling the story chronologically, trying to get out of the way, because it's not about you. It's about the subject. But woven in, the way Walker Percy taught me about his novels, woven in are certain lessons. So, Walter, now you, you say you try to get out of the way, and you do get out of the way. But I'm going to ask you a question uh, that really it goes the other way. Of all the people you've written about, who do you connect with the most? What figure felt the most familiar to you or your own experiences or ways of thinking? Now, I know it's it's a little bit like asking a parent, which child do you like the best? Right. right. And the answer, of course, would vary depending on which day you ask. But I'll give you the answer that yeah. I'm feeling now, especially given what's happening in our country and our world today, is that I associate and feel more comfortable with Benjamin Franklin. If I had to have a beer with somebody, if I had to bring somebody back, I'd say, we need Benjamin Franklin. And it's partly because Benjamin Franklin's whole life was spent trying to bring people together, doing it through journalism, doing it through diplomacy, doing it through science, doing it through creating policy, like the creation of the US postal system. This is crucial to creating the concept of a United States, is to have a post road that went from Boston to Charleston. All of these things make Benjamin Franklin the person that I would say, hey, I am most interested in, particularly because he loved ingenious devices, too. He was an inventor. As you know, he invents a lightning rod and the Franklin stove, but dozens of other things, odometers, ways to take books off of shelves. So I just got my new iPhone. I'd be saying, Dr. Franklin, let me show you how the camera works. Let me show you how the calendar works. And he would be the person from 300 years ago who would be most able, I think, to say, I get it. That's really interesting. Yeah, and your biography is a page turner. And I thought I understood the guy, but just all the time, a problem solver. Even when he's coming back to the U.S. after the revolution, and he's on the boat, and he's having a hard time having things stay stable on the table, he invents something for that. And, and he's always on the way 
when he was 17 years old to Europe the first time on his fifth trip back that you just talked about, he's always lowering barrels into the ocean to take the temperature of the water because he's trying to discover the Gulf Stream, which shows Absolutely. why boats yeah. go faster in one direction than the other. So you talked about curiosity. To me, yeah. curiosity is trait number one. Even in your 70s, you should be lowering that barrel into the water and saying, how's the Gulf Stream work? It's just amazing. Now, Walter, so as we've said repeatedly in this interview, you're a student of the history of innovation. What does this history tell you about our capacity to solve some of today's biggest challenges? Well, I, I think let's take the, what may be the biggest challenge in general for the planet, which is climate change, something that you've been deeply focused on, you and Wendy, for which thank you. And one problem I sometimes have with people who are worried about climate change is that they focus on, you know, how to stop a, you know, oil and refinery or something being built, which I'm all in favor of, and certainly shutting down coal mines. But they aren't quite as interested in the innovation that could help solve this problem. When you start talking about carbon capture, when you start talking about the need for nuclear plants, when you start talking about lithium battery refining, there are upsides and downsides to all of those things, but we cannot be knee-jerk against new technologies, knee-jerk against innovation if we want to fight climate change. So I would say that we should be more eager to embrace the innovation that could help us with climate change and some of that nimbyism, that not in my backyardism, even here in Louisiana, where they want to do big solar farms. And there are people saying, well, no, that will ruin the view. Or they're trying to do a lithium battery and lithium refining. Mm -hmm. Lithium is a very common uh, chemical. There's no shortage of lithium. But most of the refined lithium comes from China. We need to reduce that to below 50% if we're going to be safe in making batteries. So all of these things, I think, are important, innovative steps to making batteries in the U.S., making solar panels in the U.S., making the microchips that can stabilize the grid, doing nuclear, doing solar, doing wind, but also carbon capture. And I think we should not be afraid of innovation being a component, just one component of the solution uh, to the problem of climate change. It's got to be a huge part of the solution. And what I've seen in working with many of the most innovative U.S. companies, they are doing some great work right now. Now, they're going to need more support from the government, and they're going to be in order to roll these uh, new technologies out and make them commercially viable at scale. But I think there's a lot going on in this area. And, the uh, less known, but maybe one of the most important aspects of the Inflation Reduction Act, good name, I guess. I don't know how they came up with that name, but one of the best things for climate in that act is something that even you as an expert probably haven't focused too much on, which is the very smart and gradual increase in the amount of battery subsidies for lithium ion, cobalt and nickel batteries made in the United States or in North America or in friendly countries and how that has now caused Panasonic to decide to do battery manufacturing. It's caused Tesla to increase the battery manufacturing. Those policy subsidies for clean battery manufacturing not something that made the headlines in that bill, but it will probably have one of the most Im biggest impacts. I agree with you. And there's already a fair amount of discussion about uh, companies, a number of overseas companies and others building businesses in the U.S. So you will see job creation as well as climate innovation coming out of that bill. Now, Walter, you've written about great managers like Steve Jobs. Well, you've also spent many years in leadership roles yourself at CNN, Time, and at the Aspen Institute. What are the Walter Isaacson principles for management and leadership? Well, first of all, it's know thyself. You know, when you were running Goldman Sachs, you had a particular strength of uh, knowing your management style. And when you know yourself, you put people flanking you as deputies 
who fill in for things. That might be Bob Steele, our mutual friend, or many others that work with you, be it at Treasury or at Goldman. My, when I was young and a reporter at time, and then became a writer, I was having the time of my life. In 1980s, I was covering the fall of communism. I was traveling around the world. And I moved up the management ladder rather quickly, partly because people who were my bosses quit or got sick or had problems. And so there was a quick turnover at time. And suddenly I'm national editor and then eventually editor. I think I got on the management train a little bit too quickly. And one of the other things was management's not my strength. It's your strength, Hank, and it's strength of a lot of people I admire. But when I wake up each morning, I, I, I like to make people happy. And sometimes being a good manager means like being like Steve Jobs and you have to make tough decisions. So I ended up navigating my role, whether it be at Time or CNN or Aspen Institute, to where I was sort of chief product officer, you might call it, in the places I worked. But I always had a deputy who was the managing director and did that. So when, when I tell my students, I, you know, they say they want to pursue a path, maybe become a great executive. I say, okay, but understand the path to being a great executive is different than the path to being a great product innovator or a great writer or artist. Uh, do what suits your personality best. Walter, self-awareness is so important. I say I worked with all kinds of uh, successful leaders, managers, ones that weren't as successful, but the ones that were successful had one thing in common. They had self-awareness and they surrounded themselves with the right team to play to their strengths, compensate for their weaknesses. And if that doesn't happen, you know, the big job's always gonna cover the weaknesses. So know yourself. You're currently writing a biography of Elon Musk. Can you tell us about the, how that's going? Is it difficult to write about a subject like Elon who is constantly making headlines? You know, it's like drinking from a fire hose while trying to take notes because not only is he constantly doing new things and making headlines, he's been very, very open with me. I've just spent, you know, just got back from 10 days of Austin, Texas and Palo Alto and Boca Chica, Texas and various places with him. And I'm sitting in on all of his meetings, but I'm also spending time with him privately and personally learning about his life. And so I have a wealth of information. And when I signed up for this book about a year and a half ago, I thought, okay, this is going to be great. It's about an innovator who's making great electric cars, batteries, mm -hmm. and spaceships uh, that will get into orbit and maybe to Mars. Fits my interests, you know, science, technology, mm -hmm. major moonshots, so to speak. I didn't quite realize that he was going to then try to buy Twitter, that he was going to get involved in politics, that, he, you know, there'd be so many other things. So trying to weave that together in a narrative when we're in the middle of the story and the story keeps shifting is probably the most difficult thing. However, by the end of next year, I hope say, all right, here's the story. There may be a sequel, but here's how we got to where we are. And this guy is more complicated than you think. If you hate him, you're missing half of the story. If you think you're a fanboy and he can do no wrong, you're missing half of the story. And one of the jobs when I teach at Tulane and I teach my students as I'm going to today, every class, one of the things I try to teach them is to complexify things. That history is a little bit more complex, that people are more complex. Before you take down their statues and their portraits, think about how complex it is. Think about why they're going to take your portrait down someday because of the complexities in your character. Very, very true. But the thing you do so well is you write about complex subjects in simple, easy to understand ways, right? And I found that often I took simple subjects and made them too complex. You definitely want to simplify yeah. the complex parts. I'm, I hope you can read Einstein and understand relativity at least for an hour because I try to simplify it. That said, you can simplify the very complicated things. But you can realize that a James Watson, who discovered the structure of DNA, and you can make it beautiful and simple how he made that discovery, 
but that he's a very complicated person. His racism, his anti-Semitism, and you have to understand the person as a whole. You sure do, and boy, you do that. So, Walter, let's close with your advice to our young listeners. What advice do you give students who are navigating their lives and careers in today's rapidly changing world? First of all, for my students, I say get out of your comfort zone right away when it comes to what you're studying. If somebody tells me they're studying English and poetry and some of the liberal arts or humanities, I say, yeah, but are you taking a chemistry course? Are you taking a science course? Physics? Are you can do math? Oh, I don't do math. I said, well, you know, the world, if, if the language in which the good Lord painted our universe, that language is math. And it would help you to understand some of it, just as it helped Leonardo da Vinci to understand how to square the circle before he drew Vitruvian Man, that guy yeah. doing jumping jacks in the square in the circle. So I try to push all my humanities students to have two majors or a major and a minor, one in the sciences, one in the humanities. Of course, it works both ways. I do that with people who are science majors in my class. But I do fear that it's the humanities majors that are a little bit more put off by the other side by doing science and math. Most of the science and math students I know love, learn, you know, feel they can learn history, they can learn anything. And that's also what I tell my students, you can learn anything. They tell me, well, I, I can't, I said, you know what? You can learn anything. You may not totally master it, but never give up being curious. That is great advice. Walter, thank you. This has been a tour de force and you've given our listeners a lot to think about. Really appreciate today's interview. Thank you, Hank, and thanks for all you do. You have listened to Straight Talk with Hank Paulson, a podcast of the Paulson Institute. To find more episodes from leading thinkers and doers, please visit paulsoninstitute.org backslash straight talk or download on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. And don't forget to rate and subscribe. Thank you for listening and see you next time.